This is Startup Sidekick's interview series, where the storytelling from experienced tech founders and executives provides you with real, actionable tips and advice. Our goal is to help make every startup successful. Welcome to the Startup Sidekick interview. My name is Anil Amarjani. I'm the founder of Startup Sidekick. Thanks for spending some time with us today. The topic of today's interview is using UX research to build the right product. My guest is Elizabeth Bowman. Very honored to have her today. She's a VP of Client Strategy at December Labs. I'm going to let her describe what December Labs does. And prior to that, she's been an executive in various roles, including strategy, growth, and general management. So welcome today, Elizabeth. How's it going? Thank you, Anna. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm happy to have you. I guess you're joining us all the way from uh, Uruguay, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, while we do have offices in Houston, Texas, uh, we also have nearshore offices here in Uruguay. And uh, yeah, with the pandemic and all, this is for now my place to be. <laughs> yeah, I know. And um, no, the time zone, I think, really makes it really great to be you know, located there. So let's talk yep. a little bit about your company. Um, can you give us a brief overview of what makes you guys unique, sort of like the why, how, and what you guys do? Uh, sure. Um, so the, the the really short answer there is uh, here at December Labs, we have a team of uh, a, little, a little over uh, 80 people that um, uh, specialize in design and development for um, custom software solutions. Um, we work mostly um, with startups, but also with growth stage companies, enterprise companies, uh, from Google to Accenture. Um, but that's kind of, you know, like the cold introduction. What I really like to say is that, um, you know, we help people build their products, their companies, and uh, though it might sound cheesy, uh, even their dreams, because that's really what it is all about when you're an entrepreneur and are trying to build something. Um, but that said, uh, you know, really, when we are talking about building products, it's also about building the right products. And that's where UX comes into the equation. And that's why I'm really excited to be talking about UX here today with you. Yeah, same. I'm pretty excited, too. I love the UX, you know, kind of just topics around UX. Um, so let's jump into the discussion. What is UX or user experience it's a, at a very high level? Right. I mean, when it comes to UX, um, you know, there are still many people that get confused. You know, you hear UX research, you hear UX design and also many other um, related areas within design in general. Um, so UX really, um, I mean, first of all, what does it mean? UX uh, stands for user experience and it's a really um, user centric approach to understanding users problem and uh, pro you know doing the actual um, corresponding research to find a solution for that specific user problem um, it oftentimes starts kind of with mapping out a, a product um, and goes up to um, you know finally designing actually a solution oh excellent and so like why has ux become such a big deal like what are some of the benefits of ux I mean, it's that's that's actually a great question, and um, it's really interesting that UX, alongside again other um, you know design areas, is really founded in design thinking, which has actually been around since I think like the 1960s or so. Um, design thinking, you know, um, is it's just a, an overall methodology about you know how to approach again a user problem and really putting the user at a centric of any design decision. And uh, design thinking has been used in architecture, even in teaching and so many other areas for decades. But really, when it comes to software, um, UX has been becoming uh, mainstream in like just the last decade or so and has really um, grown in just the past few years. And I think that's also really a reflective of what you see in software in general. I mean, just think about, you know, how websites look like in the 90s. I mean, there was no design in there at all. And, uh, you know, and they were oftentimes, of course, not uh, very usable either. So, uh, so UX is kind of, you know, the magic that is happening to the backbone of any software project um, and is making it, you know, sleek and usable, but really, um, you know, helping you solve a problem today. Yeah. And I mean, you know, that's so important because even when I evaluate products, I mean, it's not just you know, the, the interface, but just the overall experience that the product provides, you know, and that kind of is like sort of the final decision factor if all other things being equal. So what are um, some of the challenges of UX? 
I mean, uh, that uh, that is actually something that I experience a lot when speaking to startups, you know, every day, because um, oftentimes they have heard about UX and they kind of feel that they should do some UX, but they are actually worried about UX not being affordable for them. Um, or, um, you know, maybe they say, you know, I don't really have a user base yet, so can I do UX? And um, or, or is that really something out of my league? And um, I mean, one of the challenges is, of course, that you need to include some kind of, you know, user base for testing or, or validation of your product. But it's not something that is limited only to big companies. Um, so that's again one of I think the the one the the main missions that I personally have uh, when I when I speak to people about UX research. Um, you know, don't get scared by those um, you know potential uh, challenges, but looking at you know how how you can leverage the right tactics um, that apply for you. Um, but challenges are, of course, um, yeah, uh, you know, making sure that you know what you can do and what moment of your product cycle. Um, if, for example, you want to test an existing uh, tool, um, yeah, you do have to facilitate access to some of those users. And if that's hard or if that's a problem, I mean, it has happened to us sometimes that we really have to, um, you know, push our clients um, to, to provide us with that kind of access. And it doesn't have to be oftentimes a lot of people, you know, like when I talk about user testing, I'm not saying that we have to talk to hundreds of people, because if you look at it, um, you know, sometimes speaking to five people, there are statistics um, that show that um, you, you will probably find about 80% of the potential problems that they might have with a product, because we're just not that different from each other. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, those just to give you a few examples of the challenges that are, of course, um, yeah, very user oriented, I would still say, you know, don't get scared by by UX and the challenges. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I mean, it's uh, the, the benefits really, you know, kind of outweigh all any of the cons. But um, and, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I hear people talking, they, they just say UI, UX, UI, UX, you know, kind of both yeah. of them together. But, you know, they're very different. So, like, what, how is it different from UI or user interface? I think, first of all, um, UX and UI both have the U in them for user. Um, so they're just kind of part of that same journey of building something that's really user centric and that again solves a problem uh, for users and uh, in, a, in a very specific way. But um, that said, UI is kind of what you traditionally think about, you know, when you think about software design in general, it's the colors, it's just the visuals, it's, you know, like kind of the final end product. Um, and UX, in a way, is a little bit more hidden, but it's almost like the backbone. It's the structure. It's the information architecture. Uh, and it's also, um, you know, divided into, you know, the user research part um, that is, uh, you know, really aiming at understanding what users want, um, what they're looking for. And then the UX design, which kind of try to uh, tries to, to implement that into something that is actually usable. And then kind of the UI comes on top of that. Um, that said, uh, still UX and UI kind of really integrate with each other. You know, oftentimes you might also test a final UI design um, or, you know, so, so, uh, so yeah, but um, I think overall um, they're just kind of part of that entire product design cycle. Yeah, I like the way you described that with UX as sort of the backbone, you know, kind of uh, behind all the UI and how yeah. would you say like UX has evolved over the, you know, Pat, you mentioned like, yeah, it's been around since the 60s, but it really has been, you know, coming in the forefront in the last decade or so, and even a lot more in the last four or five years, I hear. But like, do you think agile methodology has pushed it more to the forefront or just iterative development? I mean, any of those related, like how has it evolved in the last few years? I think on the one hand, users really just get a lot more um, demanding and sophisticated over the use of time and using technology products. So that again, that again, I think is reflective of, you know, those principles of design thinking, you know, being around for decades, but really UX only being now um, that visible and that needed in software development pretty recently. Because first of all, I mean, when, when, when you started to, um, to use software products, it's not that from day one, um, you know, users already had the idea of you know this is really how it could look like but today um, you know uh, when you for example have a mobile app on your phone um, you have mobile apps from you know huge companies that invest a lot of you know dollars into the design and the development of your products uh, of their products and uh, that app might be alongside an app of a startup and you kind of you're kind of competing with that so I think that's just where 
the importance of putting the user really at the center of what you're trying to build just becomes so uh, so much bigger. Um, and yeah, I think that's really been one of the keys of why UX has has become so important uh, from startups to, of course, the big companies still. And speaking of the different, you know, size organizations, I mean, how is it being used in sort of the corporate side and and is it being used in things like government and all that? I mean, have you seen any examples? Um, I think that's a great question and it kind of um, ties into what I, what I mentioned earlier um, regarding startups sometimes being afraid of, you know, not being able to afford UX and things like that. Because there are actually many different ways that you can use UX in technology. Um, when you are a small startup and uh, you're, you know, just starting out uh, to build your product, and you might have had a great idea um, and you might have validated that with some friends and family still. Once you're, um, you know, working on the design, um, validating those initial designs with actual potential users um, is a great way of just making sure that you are are actually onto something, that you are building a product that people are go actually going to use and that actually you know solves a problem for them. Um, but then when you have bigger companies, um, and uh, you know we work for example with um, with a Texas-based IT company, um, they do UX on every new features that they launch for their platform. So their platform is really sophisticated. Um, and it's really not that intuitive to use because it's really, you know, it's an enterprise product. And, um, you know, every time that they, for example, from their customer support team hear that, um, you know, certain tickets, you know, just come up again and again because things are just not that intuitive or because people are requiring new features, then they kind of, um, you know, map that out. But then very early on, include UX in that process and make sure that they validate, um, you know, any potential new features or iterations on the platform with actual users using UX activities and uh, methodologies to to, um, yeah, to validate that before they then actually spend the money on developing those. Um, yeah. That, that's just a few examples, yeah. Yeah, no, just definitely, uh, uh, you know, cheaper way of doing things too, right? Versus just like in the old ways where you just go build first, you know, and then you kind of put it out right. there and realize that, you know, like somebody even said that life is too short to be building products nobody wants, you know? <laughs> So. No, 100 percent. And I mean, also, if you look at, you know, those sad statistics of like 90 percent of all startups failing, um, I mean, that it, that partly has to do with that, with just people, you know, going forward uh, into building products without really validating them. And, you know, and again, being being afraid of you know, the, the, the budget implications or the time implications that doing some UX research and design, um, you know, might mean for them. But still, I mean, it always pays out in the long run. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And so, like, how do you go about setting up a sort of a new UX program within a company? Um, again, of course, it depends on the you know, kind of moment, uh, you know, of your product cycle that we're in, if this is something, you know, that you're just starting out to build, or um, if you already have an existing product and want to kind of integrate UX into that cycle. Um, when it is the, the kind of, you know, the first case of uh, just, you know, starting something from scratch, then on the one hand, uh, you know, we might get into user sourcing in the beginning because you don't have an actual user base yet. Um, to just kind of see, you know, who we can speak to, who we can observe using those really initial ideas of a product before actually building it. Um, then, uh, for example, if you have already uh, finalized the design phase and uh, we're already in development still, there are moments that we can include UX kind of further on. For example, um, oftentimes UX validation is being used before you actually, um, you know, do a beta launch of your project just to make sure that actually everything that you planned initially in the design phase um, is actually solving that problem when people are physically, you know, using your app, your software or however. Um, then on the other hand, when you are one of those bigger companies where you already have an entire kind of product cycle and, um, you know, feature release plan that you're following, um, there the integration is a little bit different because, um, you know, you have to have a different kind of integration and interaction with, for example, the development team or the QA team, um, you know, QA for quality assurance, um, who might also be somehow involved in, in, in that cycle. Or um, also when you already have an existing product, Again, as in the case that I mentioned re um, just a few minutes ago, um, you might want to integrate with the customer success team, um, you know, that is actually listening to your clients every day. Um, so, yeah, I think it's always about 
really understanding what kind what kind of moment of your product cycle you're in and how you can leverage these tactics to build a better product. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And then, uh, like, you know, there's so many um, different kind of methods and processes around UX too, right, that are either qualitative or quantitative. Um, what are some of the ones that you've used or that you like or recommend? You know, for example, there's surveys, there's interviews, then there's A-B testing, usability testing, parallel design. There's so many different ones I came across, you know. I know. And it's actually amazing because it seems always like there is actually one specific UX tactic for your specific problem you know, or your specific need. Because there are, while there are kind of um, big overall, you know, tactics and of course, you know, UX, again, you know, having the user as its center is very user centric and you will probably be involving users. And um, so then there are many activities that are very specific and that can just help you validate one very small part of your actual product. Um, but getting into a, a couple of examples, on the one hand, yes, surveys or interviews are oftentimes, you know, some of the main um, possibilities of um, asking uh, your users or potential users questions about your product, about themselves, about their environment, about how they would use um, your actual platform or product. And um, and those, for example, um, yeah, can like also kind of depend on how many people you have access to. With surveys, for example, you can send out a survey with very little effort to many people. Um, so one of the one of the um, the clients that we've been working uh, a lot in UX with for the last year is a big financial institution, and we are um, you know doing UX work on several of their internal platforms, and oftentimes have actually thousands of potential users that we can take into consideration. But you know it's just not efficient, and time wise doesn't make any sense to talk to thousands of users. But we can send out quickly a user a, a survey to you know uh, those uh, thousands of users and validate you know some of our initial ideas and findings and that's actually also a great way to prep for the actual interviews because you can kind of narrow down what um, you will then ask people in person because time is really of the essence and you know and for for any type of user may it be an internal user a client you know whatever end user it is um, you know get, like taking half an hour or an hour away from their time to kind of speak about how they use a specific pro uh, product is not that easy sometimes so you have to be very very well prepped and a survey for example really helps in that sense for interviews um, and a couple of other things that you can differentiate between is, um, you know, as you said, qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, the qualitative research goes more into the why and the quantitative research more into what, um, you know, it's more looking at metrics and everything. Um, other ways to differentiate um, between methodologies is the attitudinal, which means, um, you know, you listen to what users say. Um, actually to you, for example, in interviews, while behavioral is more about observing them. And that is also something that you can differentiate in, in interviews, for example. You can do the moderated, unmoderated, remote, in person. Um, so yeah, th th those are just, you know, many of those small kind of, you know, uh, differences between how you can execute some of those, um, some of those instances, but then also within those interviews, um, you can use specific tactics, um, that again, you can use to validate, um, certain parts of your, of your platform. For example, if you are just, um, trying to validate the overall navigation, then card sorting might be a great tool. Um, we have actually had that that in, uh, in one case where we found through the UX research that, um, you know, we have been observing in analytics and with heat maps that people were always um, really jumping between different sections of the web platform. And then, uh, you know, use tools such as card sorting where you ask them to, um, to kind of group certain topics together so that they tell you what they feel really belongs together. And we noticed that, um, you know, the, really the hierarchy of the site and the overall navigation was not as intuitive for them because they would always go first to point a and then point b but those two were very much far apart um so yeah that's i think just the beauty overall of uh, the different opportunities that ux provides you with um just leveraging those different tactics yeah so i mean if you know just to kind of wrap things up like if you had if there was an organization whether it's a startup or a large company that's looking to either bring you know set up a new UX program or improve one? Like what kind of takeaways would you tell give them? 
Um, first of all, you know, again, don't get scared by potential challenges. Um, there is a way to do UX for everyone and for UX to provide value. Uh, secondly, UX actually does oftentimes provide you with an actual return of investment. Uh, for example, if you have a platform and uh, that's being uh, used by thousands of users and you can uh, you know, save every user a couple of minutes per day uh, on using that platform, you know, just think about what that means on an annual basis, you know, multiplying that by users um, or even you know, just freeing up time for your customer support team you know, by solving those issues that they have to deal with every day. There, there are actually returns of investments of UX that are tangible. And thirdly, um, you know, just never forget the focus of, you know, trying to build the right product, trying to build a product that actually solves a problem for users and, um, yeah, and use UX to kind of help you guide you uh, through that way. Yeah, no, I'm a big believer in it. So, well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for doing this. This is great stuff. I mean, there's so many value nuggets in there, you know, so um, looking forward to getting this out to our audience. I appreciate you doing this. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And if anyone, you know, from your audience, uh, you know, is interested in discussing this further or has any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We are actually currently um, developing kind of our own UX methodology for startups that is really tailored to just, you know, um, the specific situation that startups are in. And in the meantime, feel free to check out our blog, which is um, blog.decemberlabs.com, um, where we frequently um, publish articles about UX, about design and anything kind of related to the product cycle i'm glad you mentioned the website i was going to you know ask you to mention <laughs> it and uh so because i didn't know i already did studies on there too that were good you know so you guys are doing some good stuff and uh, best of luck you know thank you 